Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Geographic Society of Chicago's November Travelogue. I'm Jill Andrada from the GSE office, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Now, if you're a regular here, uh, you're probably familiar with Julie Watkins, who has been so terrific in hosting these webinars. Julie has recently started a new job, which conflicts with the usual travelogue time frame. So that's why she's not with us today. But congratulations to Julie, and we hope to see her again soon. If this is your first time yeah, attending a GSC event, welcome and thank you for tuning in. The Geographic Society of Chicago has educated the public about geography and its important uses since 1898. Today's GSC trains students in the latest geospatial technologies. Through services such as our geospatial technology programs, we offer unique educational experiences that harness the power of maps and the integrative tools of GIS geographic information systems to solve environmental and community issues. Together, our board and membership provides education opportunities for students and educators, assist in building geographic materials, collections in educational and cultural institutions, promote an emerging technologies in problem solving and much more. Today's travelogue presenter is Cliff Haig, Emeritus Professor at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, Scotland. Cliff will share his personal experiences and explore the history behind today's Rainbow Nation. He'll help us travel up the Table Mountain into the townships and informal settlements. We'll see the four trucker wagon trains, Nelson Mandela's cell, and do a little bit of safari. Cliff, thank you again for being with us today and in presenting on South Africa. Okay, uh, so uh, what I, yeah, I want to talk about South Africa, um, drawing on the visits that I made there and some background uh, material. Uh, I put the two flags up at the start because the one on the left is the flag of the pre, uh, uh, the apartheid um, South Africa. It actually was first adopted in 1928. Uh, and the one on the right is the, the new flag that came in after apartheid and flags in uh, South Africa, rather like in the USA, have been somewhat a controversial issue. So just a, a brief background uh, introduction to the very basic geography. Um, the area is roughly eight times the size of Illinois, uh, the area of South Africa. The trip from Cape Town in, in the south uh, up to Hauteng, up to Johannesburg is about a 15 or 16 hour drive. And uh, it's roughly the equivalent going from Chicago to Jacksonville, Florida. Population 60 million people thereabouts uh, compared with Illinois 12.7 million. Life expectancy at birth across South Africa is 64 compared with 79 in USA and a very significant difference in GDP per capita between roughly $5,000 uh, compared with 69,000, very, very close to 70,000 in the USA. Climatically, uh, you've got a pretty long coastline. Um, the, the Northwest area inter interior is really desert country, very, very dry. The, the North uh, is, uh, is is northeast is um, tropical and humid, and the south is a kind of California type of climate. And in the middle, you've got a, a very large high plateau area, which uh, um, is is substantially grassland. So that's the, the the very basic picture. How I first went there was in 1995, November 1995, when. Um, just uh, a few months really after the democratic elections, first democratic post-apartheid elections. And I was invited along to give a keynote speech to a meeting, a sort of a retreat at this rather strange place, Club Mykonos, a, a um, holiday village basically on the, on the, on the coast. Uh, and the aim of that meeting was to find a way to reconstruct the planning profession, the urban and regional planning profession in South Africa after apartheid. And the, the note there on the right is, uh, is from the, the, the host of that meeting who invited me. So that was my first visit. And since then, I guess I've been, I don't know, you know, 12, 13 times, something like that. 
and uh, but all my visits really have been professional visits i've never actually just gone on holiday there i've mainly been based in universities or involved in meetings about a book or things like that so or in conferences so that's um that, that's how i've experienced the country and uh, mainly then been to the big cities and not really um in into some of the tourist areas like Kruger National Park in, in the north. So um, my first visit was to Cape Town, and that's also where Europeans first saw um, th this part of Africa. And I still remember what a spectacular view it was flying into to Cape Town and seeing it from the, the airplane, airplane windows after a very long flight, I think about 10, 12 hour flight from, from the UK. And the area was home to indigenous peoples long before the Europeans arrived. And the first Europeans to, to see this part of Africa were the Portuguese who were navigating to find ways around to the, uh, to, to the Indies uh, and to the, um, the spices and uh, various trade, uh, trading opportunities that they, they offered. And so in many ways, uh, it's very similar sort of time to Columbus going west, uh, except that these people were going east, but similar sort of voyage of discovery um, type of uh, uh, exploration. And once news of um, the existence of the Cape got through, it actually influenced map making. Uh, this world map from 1489 to 1490 uh, you can see at the bottom there that there's a, a slight kink that's been added just going over the border when the uh, Cape of Good Hope was, was, um, was rounded in 1487. So I always think that one's quite a, a fun image of how, uh, how geographers have to adapt to changing information. Of course, there's no, no visibility of uh, the Americas on, on that world map at that stage. So the, the first real settlers were the Dutch, uh, and uh, particularly this guy, Jan van Riebeek, who uh, became the first European to set foot there in 1652. Again, somewhat similar to the time of the Mayflower, just a few decades later. And van Riebeek was sent by the Dutch East India Company uh, as part of their commercial activity, uh, which was global really to establish a supply station for ships on the way round from Europe to India uh, and uh, of course before the, the days of the Suez Canal. So uh, this was the, the origins of uh, the European settlement. And with that settlement came slavery. The Dutch East India Company brought in slaves, um, mainly from the East, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, um, to to work on the, um, the 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 agriculture that was was developing there and supplying fruit and veg to passing ships. Uh, also, some slaves coming from West Africa, from India and Sri Lanka. And so you begin to see the start of this rainbow nation that Jill mentioned uh, in her introduction. And um, with the slaves came different. Um, religious faiths, um, uh, Islam and, and Hindu faiths. And uh, slaves were a very significant part of this early colony. Uh, during the 18th century, as I put there, there were actually more slaves than free people in the Cape Colony. So again, a, a, an origin story that is linked to the, the horrors of slavery. And there is a slave museum in, in Cape Town is, uh, that, that recognizes this. The British um, occupied the Cape Colony in 1795 and then returned it to the Dutch in 1802 and before they then annexed it again in 1806. And so from 1806, the Cape was basically being ruled by uh, Britain and English was declared the official language. Now I have to remember in this that most of the uh, other settlers there from Europe were, were Dutch and Dutch would have been their language. And the pound, pound from British pound became the official currency. 
And after 1820, there's quite considerable immigration into the Cape from Britain. So you, you have, again, this, this increasingly complex picture of different national and ethnic groups occupying the same territory. And what followed was, was conflict. Uh, the British had already attacked the indigenous people and taken their land. Uh, and in 1834, things got more problematic still in that Great Britain finally abolished slavery in all its colonies. Slavery had been abolished 1808, I think it is, uh, but uh, the, 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 the trade in, in slaves had been abolished, but slavery abolished in all the colonies in 1834, which included the Cape. And the provision was made for compensation, not of course to the slaves, but to the slave owners. But the catch in it was that you had to actually go to London to get your compensation. And as you can imagine, the Dutch slave owners were rather unhappy about this, the prospect of having to literally track halfway across the world to, to get what they saw was their, their, their proper compensation. And so you get increasing dissatisfaction, increasing tension between the Boers and the, the British and the farmers, the Boers, the Dutch, uh, essentially decide that they're going to move beyond Cape Colony. They're going to search out for a new homeland. And again, there's some parallels here with the, the American situation uh, in terms of uh, these people didn't go west, they went, they went north and east. And <coughs> so, um, from 1835 to 1840, there was a big movement, which is called the Great Trek, as they moved inland and north and east. And they went in ops-drawn wagons, wagon trains, and again, very many similarities to the kind of stories that, uh, that you'll all be familiar with from the USA. Now, this is where we get to the tricky bit of the, uh, of, of the presentation. So I've got to hope here that I'm going to do this right. right. You just have to uh, be patient for a moment. But what I'm aiming to do is show you a little bit of a movie made in 1916, which um, called The Vortrekkers. So hopefully, here we are. So we're just at the point where General Pretorius is sending for all the Boers in the district to join him in reinforcing the the uh, the struggling um, Boer travellers. If our reinforcements do not arrive before the Zulus attack again, we are lost. That really could be the US cavalry coming over the hill. And here they are arriving and relieving the, uh, the stricken wagon train. Okay, hopefully we, we're back now. So that's, that's the, the movie, and it goes on to tell the story of the Battle of Blood River, uh, which was um, really kind of fundamental uh, piece of, it, it would be wrong to call it mythology, because it's an actual event, but it's, it's, it's the, the story that by which the Africana people identified themselves. Uh, the battle in which um, 500 Boers defeated uh, an army of around 12,000 Zulus. And again, you can see from this image how uh, the wagon train was formed into the circle and uh, they were shooting from there. And the story is that when they made the film with the, the Zulus as the extras, that not all of them obeyed the instructions to fall down dead when they were told to do so, but some of them kept running and attacked the, uh, the whites who were playing the, the boars uh, behind the, the wagon trains. 
So the the Dutch largely then um, had moved into Transvaal and um, uh, Natal and the uh, and and the Orange Free State rather, and the British were basically in Natal and Cape Colony, and then came a kind of gold rush equivalent. Diamonds were found, and gold was found, and so you had a, a huge in migration of people from the south, from the, the British colonies, uh, in chase of the, these, this new mineral wealth. And that met resistance from the, uh, the, the Boers, the Boer, the Boer trekkers who'd gone there. And what happened was basically a couple of wars with 180,000 British troops capturing these two republics, though there continued to be a guerrilla resistance. And uh, one of the things that the colonists did at that stage, the British colonists was created concentration camps in which uh, it's estimated 26,000 Boers died and some 20,000 black Africans. So it's a pretty brutal story that it goes behind this, uh, this uh, contemporary country. The period of apartheid uh, lasted from 1848 till 1991. There was a period before that, between the end of the Boer War uh, and 1948, where basically um, South Africa was part of the, the, the British uh, Empire, then Commonwealth. Uh, but then um, from 1948, the uh, apartheid regime um, kicked in and there was legislation prohibiting, for example, mixed marriages. Um, and the overall philosophy was in a sense very geographical. Uh, it was separate development, that separate racial groups would live in separate areas. And uh, there were three categorized groups, whites, Indians and coloreds, who were basically um, the, the descendants from those earlier um, uh, slaves brought from the, the, the East and, and Blacks who were the, the original African population. So everything was segregated on these bases right down to, to where you could sit, as you can see there. And as well as this, under this, this uh, policy, there were Bantu stands, which were supposedly the tribal homelands. So in effect, Blacks in particular had no uh, sort of legitimate place in urban areas. They were supposed to live in rural areas, uh, often with very poor quality land and be temporary residents within the cities. This policy uh, created some difficulties to implement. Very often it's easier to generate a policy than it is to implement it. And one of the problems was just from history and geography that um, the Cape Town had uh, an area in particular, District 6, which had developed in the late 19th, early 20th century, quite close to the city center, and mainly uh, a place that uh, Indians and coloreds uh, uh, inhabited, but was actually racially mixed. And this, of course, therefore, um, posed a problem for the apartheid system because that area really that close to the city center was seen as being necessarily a white neighborhood within the, the mindset of uh, apartheid. So what followed was a clearance and eviction of up to 6,000 families uh, that took place in 1966 uh, when it was declared a white area. And the people who were evicted who were long-term residents in many cases, were moved out to the Cape Flats, which is some 16 miles away, and with very few uh, economic opportunities there. Whereas in comparison, the, the jobs of the city centre were a source of employment for the District 6 residents. And this became a very controversial uh, move. Uh, it, it focused international attention on what was happening under apartheid, but there was also local resistance. And the result was that uh, although there was clearance of the area, the planned rebuilding was stalled 
uh, apart from the development of a technical college uh, on the site. And it's now all commemorated in a museum, the District 6 Museum, uh, which you can visit and uh, tells this story uh, in de greater detail than, than I can at this, this time. But all this time after apartheid, it's proved actually rather difficult to rebuild District 6. That was one of the big hopes after the end of apartheid. Uh, as you can see from this aerial shot, the, the pre-clearance the, the pre -clearance pattern of streets were, were still visible. But the problem became one of restitution. Who had the right previously to, to live there? And of course, very often people hadn't kept detailed um, legal documents and so forth. Uh, they'd probably never expected to move back. So uh, it, it all became very complicated and, um, and, and, and really not much happened. It's, it's a rather sad story. So this was a shot I took uh, on the site there. You can see the technical college. You can see how close it is to the city center. So um, as I said a few moments ago, uh, Blacks were expected to live in rural areas, but be temporary residents in the cities where their labor was required. And there were past laws which restricted where you could, uh, could go. Uh, and if you were in the wrong, wrong area and didn't, have, didn't show the right pass, uh, you could be arrested. And the typical pattern had been of, of male workers uh, living in um, these kind of uh, hostile accommodation uh, because they were, say, temporary, it was seen under apartheid. Uh, it's, th th these were actually in Cape Town, but the, the pattern was more extensive in the mining areas, which we'll come to later in, in Johannesburg. And in fact, the pattern of uh, what we call circular migration, people moving partly between urban and rural, um, predates apartheid and still exists at the present is one way is that people maintain uh, family um, family incomes back in in very poor rural regions is by people doing spells working in in the city so this is some of the th those hostels the, the other place where blacks were accommodated were in designated townships and these are the kind of housing there. And I mentioned the Cape Flats a, a few moments ago when I said that uh, the people from District 6 were relocated there. They, these were a couple of shots that, that come from the Cape Flats. So this is the kind of township housing that was provided. But really, th there really was only housing provided. It was, uh, it was pretty uh, deficient, particularly in terms of jobs. Uh, but also in terms of much in the way of, of social facilities. What happened after 1987, when um, the past laws were repealed, was that, uh, that this pent up demand from poorer people to move to the cities, the kind of movement that we've seen through the generations and across the world of poor people from rural areas moving into cities where there's opportunity, that migration escalated. And where could they go? Basically, people went into the townships and into areas of open space between, um, bet between different parts of the city, the, the buffer zones that had largely separated black and white communities. And we had a very rapid growth of informal settlements. And you can see here um, in Gugaletu, one of the informal settlements in, uh, in, in Cape Town with the, the, the mountains behind. Again, one of the things which really focused attention on apartheid South Africa was the Rivonia trial in 1963-64. Uh, where Mandela uh, was, um, was condemned uh, to jail and, and very nearly condemned to death. And the, uh, the image on the right is from the, um, is from the, 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 the museum. And 
it's a quote, famous quote from him in the, in the trial. I've fought against white domination and I've fought against black domination. I've cherished the ideal of a demo democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve, but it needs be, it's an ideal for which I'm prepared to die. And um, Mandela's speech really did go around the world and revealed uh, what, what uh, the, 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 yeah, the depth of discrimination and the, the political problem of trying to move from apartheid to a democratic situation. And Mandela had indeed been active in armed resistance to the regime. Uh, and that was why he was brought to trial. So as say, you can go from Cape Town on the boat, uh, as I did, uh, across to Robben Island, I think it's about 20 minutes or something like that, the boat ride. And then you can visit the prison where Mandela was held for many, many years. You see the exercise yard and the limestone quarry where the prisoners worked. And this was a, a kind of cave in the quarry, which is used as a toilet, but also where the ANC prisoners, the African National Council prisoners, uh, held their what they called their parliament, where basically the what, who would be those who would become future leaders of the democratic South Africa uh, planned their future and the, how they would run things. And you can see Mandela's cell, which is along the corridor, as you see on the left, and then there's quite, quite small uh, space that, that he had. 1990, he was released and um, the transition from apartheid was already underway and came to the fore just a few years later. So what else can you do in Cape Town? Well, you can go up on the cable car up the mountain, well worth a, a trip, spectacular views back down over the city and over the, the waterfront, as you can see from that. And when you are up there, you also get some great views down to the Cape, the Cape of Good Hope and uh, uh, extremely spectacular scenery and seascapes. Similarly, um, there's a drive around the Cape of Good Horn itself, which of course has got this unique uh, fauna and flora, as it's the point where the two oceans meet, the warm water from the Indian Ocean and the colder water from the Atlantic. And out of that, uh, you often get this, this mist hold, hold, holding over the, the, the Cape. That was a picture on the left was my, my first visit there in, uh, in 1995. Uh, this, these couple were taken on a later visit. Um, there's many fabulous beaches up that coast. Uh, Clifton Beach is, is perhaps one of the best known. And again, of course, under apartheid, this would have been a whites only beach. Uh, and you also have excellent seafood restaurants in, in Clifton. And uh, this is just what about, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour out of, out of the city. There's also been some uh, very significant developments on Cape Town's waterfront um, since the end of apartheid. The VNA waterfront is a, a, a bit like um, Pier 49, is it, in Chicago? Uh, where, Navy Pier, sorry, I was thinking of one, I think, in, in California. A bit like Navy Pier uh, with, you know, a mix of, um, of restaurants and, and retail uh, with the waterfront and, and so on. But, um, it does rather have a more spectacular backdrop than anything that, uh, that, that can be presented in Chicago, which is so flat. So, so that's been one. And of course, it, well, it, it is crucial to uh, the, the tourist industry. Uh, it's, it's on everybody's stopping point. And um, 
is part of this sort of post-apartheid repositioning of the city as it opened up to the world. Perhaps more, even more controversial in some ways was the uh, development of the soccer stadium at Green Point. This was for the, the, the World Cup uh, championships that were held in South Africa uh, in 2010. And uh, this is a purpose-built stadium. There's always controversy about me mega sporting events where very often um, huge public money is put into the, the sort of infrastructure uh, which has not really got long-term use. There was already a major rugby stadium um, in, in Cape Town at Newlands. Uh, but the organizers of the World Cup who um, strike a hard bargain were determined to have a spectacular aerial view that could be beamed around the world uh, with the, the start of the, this, this global tournament. So uh, this stadium was built, huge costs at Greenpoint, just behind the VNA waterfront. But in a part of town, very distant from where the, the, the soccer fans are, who are mainly in the townships. Uh, historically, rugby and cricket were the, the dominant sports of the white South Africans. Soccer was the dominant uh, passion of the black community. And so uh, th there were lots of, lots of criticisms of this, this stadium development. Uh, that, that they did actually also use another stadium uh, in, in one of the townships, but um, it was certainly high expense. So where we left in Cape Town is that there's still these contrasting, what are called contrasting and contesting legacies, that um, there's still these uh, informal housing, deep poverty, and there's still the bus relief there celebrating the, the um, Vortracker uh, and the, the early colonial uh, lifestyle. From Cape Town, you can go out, what, three quarters of an hour or something to Stellenbosch, which is at the heart of the Cape wine country. Plenty of opportunities for wine tasting. Stellenbosch, again, was very much an Afrikaans town, very much celebrating the, the, the Boer farmer, as you can see by, from that statue on the left. It's an attractive little town with uh, th these colonnaded white, white low buildings uh, and nice cafes, nice restaurants, uh, and all in all, a very, very pleasant little place to, to visit. Uh, and as I say, while you're there, you can take in the, the, the wineries as well. So that's, again, a, a key part. But again, you know, the, it's not really changed that much from the apartheid era. I think these images would show that, although there are in some informal developments now on the hillsides uh, around the town. So let's now go up those couple of hours on the plain to Johannesburg, which is a very different city uh, to Cape Town. Cape Town, as I say, is a Californian type climate, um, very, very uh, spectacular, very enjoyable sort of city. Johannesburg is basically a mining settlement, a fast growth mining settlement early in the 20th century. And uh, it's still very much got that character. It's, uh, it's over 6,000 feet above sea level, a bit like Denver. So the air is thin, the atmosphere is thin, and you've got these spoil heaps from the, um, from the mining that still are a significant part of the townscape. So it was established 1886. It's now the center of an agglomeration of about 8 million people in Gauteng. Uh, say almost 6,000 feet above sea level. It really is the main commercial capital, not just of South Africa, but the whole of Southern Africa. 
And unusually for a big city, it isn't actually on a water course. And it's, it's on this high plateau. Uh, it it's always seems to me a very kind of hard place, very much in your face type of city. The, the city center there um, has had something of a revival post apartheid. There's been a big attempt to, to uh, create destinations and attractions there. Uh, but um, it had gone through a very bad period. When I first went there in 95, uh, there was a lot of empty property, partly because, of course, sanctions had been applied against South Africa. And uh, a lot of businesses, as also as we'd see in a moment or two, moved. So again, um, apartheid and post-apartheid. This map from the census of 2011 shows, I think, just how racially divided the city of Johannesburg still is. The white areas are colored in that sort of pinky purple color. The black African areas are in the blue and the, the colored are in the orange and, and the Indian or Asian are in the green. And you can see that there's a, a really big divide between North and South. And what we have is really, you know, 30 years, well, this was perhaps 20, 20 years after um, the end of apartheid, uh, still a very racially divided city, as of course, Chicago is also. And previously the mine dumps had divided uh, very often been used as kind of buffers between the, the different ethnic groups. And you can st still see some of these on there in the white blobs. So as I said, a lot of the businesses moved north in the late 80s, 1990s. And so the traditional city center was really rather run down and new suburban um, kind of edge city centers developed, most notably at Santon, which you, if you just, if we just go back, the one Santon is up here. You can just see it, this, this corner here. Uh, so, uh, and Santon is, uh, let me just, Santon is very close to Alexandra, which was the a township. So, um, Santon then is a major commercial center uh, developed in the, in the early 90s. Um, and over the years that I've been there, it has a Nelson Mandela Square. It's got a full range of um, mall type shopping and hotels and cinemas and things like that, restaurants, cafes. The, the big change that you really have seen in the periods that I've been going there from 95 through till the last couple of years before COVID uh, was the growth of a black middle class that was much more visible in places like the Santon Center than it was in 1995, where it was still uh, pretty overwhelmingly white. And then, uh, sorry, that should be Alexandra, not Alexandria, I mistype in. Um, these, these photos from the, the Glasgow University project that I've, uh, I've been involved in. And um, these show a couple of shots from Alexandra. Uh, the, again, the contrast in retailing between this, uh, the, this hair salon, the, the proprietor there waiting for, um, waiting for customers. So, so, you know, that's, that's one part of the retail of Janisburg, that, that's the other part. And again, as we saw in, um, in Cape Town, uh, migrant workers hostels, I think certainly from my recollections, the ones that I saw in Alexandra are larger than, than they were in, in Cape Town, which probably reflects the, the dominance of migrant workers in the, um, in the mining industry. But the, th this hostel no longer maintained, basic services have collapsed. Um, it's not a place to hang around in. And around the edge of the city, um, I think I took these in 2010, 2011, I can't just remember which visit it was, but this was absolutely right on the edge. That This is the, the, newest, the newest additions to the town. And again, um, informal retailing 
uh, part of the the explosive growth of a more over 200 informal settlements in Johannesburg. Also in Johannesburg is Soweto. We saw it on that that map a, a few moments ago in the southwest of the city, uh, still overwhelmingly a uh, black area, uh, developed as a black township, and again hit global notoriety in 1976 with the shooting of Hector Peterson uh, as part of the resistance from um, black students to the imposition of Afrikaans as the language in schools. And um, that photograph taken by Sam Zima, uh, again, really did go around the world of the, the dying boy being carried there after the South African police and, and forces opened fire on, on demonstrators. And the spot is commemorated there in, um, in Soweto. And Soweto was also the home of Mandela. And you can visit the Mandela house, although he only returned for 11 days after his release. And nearby was also the home of uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who actually coined the phrase, I think, the, the uh, Rainbow Nation. Very interestingly, uh, between Pretoria and Johannesburg, nearer to Pretoria, is the Vortrecker Monument, which was built in 1949, or completed in 49, built over two or three years. Um, and it's a memorial to that, uh, that trek and to the, the Vortrecker movement. And uh, so it's got continuity to that clip from the film that I showed. And you know, if you think what, what happened in Eastern Europe after the collapse of communism, where many of the, the statues and, and memorials were removed, there was a conscious decision in the spirit of peace and reconciliation, conscious decision in South Africa to retain this and even to declare it as a national heritage site. So the, this was a kind of... Um, trying to build understanding and acceptance and reconciliation for what had done, what had been happening in the past. And the design of the monument commemorates this Battle of Blood River, which I mentioned, where the, 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 the wagons, you can see them around here, 64 wagon trains, wagons formed the circle that resisted the, the Zulu army. And inside the, the monument is this, it, it, just a shot of a relief that's, uh, that's on the wall there. So as you can see, it's, it's also on a hill, you know, so it, it's the most forceful statement of Afrikanerdom. And of course, when it was built of Africana uh, majority rule in perpetuity. And again, one of the, thing, the remarkable things that they've done post-apartheid was to create this commemorative wall in the Vortrecker Monument, the kind of, you know, holy ground of Afrikanerdom. And the wall commemorates, as I put there, the members of the South African Defence Forces, the, the South African military, who died in service of their country between 1961 and 1994. In other words, these were people who died fighting the armed resistance against, um, against apartheid. And they're, they're honored in this wall. So it's, I think, you know, quite a magnanimous gesture. Also from Johannesburg, I've gone out a couple of times on safari. Um, taking these pictures of, of wild animals, which uh, were derided as saying that the lion looks sleepy and things like that. And um, there's rhinos, there's leopards, um, all sorts of things. So the, the, real, the really big um, safaris are, are further north up in Kruger, but this one is really quite accessible from Johannesburg, just half an hour or so out of the city. And uh, uh, you, you can see the animals in the wild there and uh, experience one of the great thrills of Africa of, of safari. Other places to, to go and see, um, 
Durban uh, on the coast, um, warm tropical climate, spectacular beaches again. Again, a rather run down city centre as uh, investment shifted more towards the, the edge of the city. Uh, and again, uh, the pattern of informal developments also very evident there. Pretoria, which is the head of the seat of government there on the, the right, uh, where the, and the presidency. And um, Pretoria is well known for these jacaranda trees, which uh, uh, as I think you can see there are really spectacular. And another place that I've visited is the Drakensberg Mountains, uh, part of this escarpment that, um, that runs around uh, much of the interior. Uh, and uh, these, again, uh, are, there's resorts there, Cathedral Peak, uh, brilliant air quality, exotic flowers, um, a, a great place to visit. But going through there, going to there, you pass through some um, rural areas. It's basically on the way between Johannesburg and Pretoria, and I, I, I did it um, on, a, on a drive between the two in 2002, I think it was. And um, so you really do get a sense of just how um, depressed the, the rural economy was. So trying to, to tie things together as we're running out of time. You know, it's quite a long time now since the end of apartheid, but the challenges remain very deep. The, the legacies I've tried to show, the legacy in terms of the built environment and the segregation that was endemic in that and the income differentials that were, were so um, stark remains deeply problematic. As I said earlier, the ending of the past laws unleashed a wave of urbanization. And what's happened over the last 20, 30 years is also that there's been substantial in-migration from other African countries into um, particularly Cape Town, Johannesburg, particularly Johannesburg. And uh, South Africa now 66% urban, expected to go on to 70, 75% over the next 10 years. But the form of urbanization is slum led basically, uh, and intensification of informal areas. You can see this picture on the right, which was taken by Ivan Turek, uh, who is one of the South African researchers on the Glasgow project. Um, but you can see, you know, people adding stories to informal buildings. Um, uh, I, I don't know how many stories you can add before uh, structurally it just becomes a bit of a disaster, but there's such a premium on land. And there's also, I didn't show them, but there's also a uh, back building uh, of, of shacks in the backyards in townships behind those kind of township houses I showed earlier, you find um, people building a shack in the backyard and getting a, a rental income or possibly a, a, a family member that's living there. South Africa remains deeply unequal, uh, one of the most unequal countries on, on earth. And in the built environment, contrast between these sprawling ranch house suburbs, gated suburbs in, in the north. I did one stray into one accidentally uh, with a car and uh, you've got all these signs around saying, you know, armed response, uh, everything is quite a scary moment actually. Um, and throughout it, the, the whole issue about land and how to reform historical inequities in patterns of land ownership has been very difficult for the South African government to resolve. And so the urban land market is, as I've said, they're largely unreformed. And um, the, one of the dilemmas after apartheid was to whether to, if you like, spread the, because the expectations were sky high. So did you spread the jam thinly by trying to improve everybody's housing a little bit, or did you concentrate 
and spread it more thickly in some places, but leave others untouched. And in the end, it was closer to the latter that the policy followed. So deep housing problems. Again, in South Africa, as just about everywhere on, the, on earth, there's now climate problems. You would have perhaps heard of the um, drastic floods that occurred in Durban earlier this year, in our spring, their, their late winter, um, 459 known deaths. And you can see how vulnerable, you know, most of the informal housing tends to be built in vulnerable locations through the world over. Energy is another problem. It's Africa's most industrialized economy, but uh, there are regular power cuts and there were regular power cuts last winter, um, which was uh, our summer. There's reliance on coal-fired power stations because there is substantial coal reserves, but they're aging and the country's attempting transition to renewables and more environmentally friendly forms of energy. But serious problems for an industrial economy if you've not got a regular power supply. And there's problems of violent crime. Um, 1853, 1853 murders in Johannesburg in 2021, uh, a rate of 30.8 per 100,000, which is even more than Chicago, where there were only 310 homicides uh, uh, and 1255 shootings in the first six months of 2022. And the murder rate in 2020 was 28.6 per 100,000, both of which, of course, are less than St. Louis, where the rate was 65.3. And Cape Town has got a, a somewhat similar um, rate of murders as St. Louis. So finally, thanks for listening. I uh, hope we've left a little bit of time for a couple of questions. Uh, and I've put my own website up there and also, if you want to follow up some of the research reports uh, from this Glasgow University project, uh, which I say focused on Johannesburg and Cape Town, along with 12 other cities across six other countries, um, I put one of the links to, to, to that, but you can navigate your way around that Centre for Sustainable Cities uh, .ac.uk site. So thanks very much for listening, and I'll hand back to Jill. Wonderful, thanks Cliff. All right, wonderful, that was really great. That was a very thorough presentation and I actually learned a lot about South Africa, so thank you for that. All right, so at this time, um, we'll go over a couple of questions. I believe some of you had posted some questions in the Q&A and if you haven't yet, but do have questions, there is some time to put in your questions before the travelogue ends. Um, okay, so first question. Uh, so Cliff, cheers Cliff, and thanks for sharing your knowledge and experiences in South Africa. The board trackers film you showed a clip from was released a year after the birth of a nation's release in the US. Both these films were important in the history of films in their nations, but we all know of the controversy and disgust that arose almost immediately after the birth of a nation. Was there any similar reaction to uh, the board truckers. It seems that it has taken on an identity as being a favorite of Boer historical groups. Can you please share any more about the film and its history through the period of apartheid? Okay, um, I, I'm not aware that there was so much controversy, but you know, America was the global capital of the movie industry and South Africa wasn't. Uh, and America is much bigger uh, numerically than South Africa. So uh, I think there was more of a focus uh, there for partly be just because of scale in respect to birth of a nation. Uh, and um, it's perhaps, you know, I, I don't think I've ever seen birth of a nation right through. Uh, Four Trekkers is, is perhaps less didactic. It's, it's, it's telling what it, what is a sort of historical story? It's it's uh, it's factually based, but obviously it's interpreted very much from one perspective. So uh, you can see it on um, on YouTube, 
it's quite difficult to to get it. It's, it's rarely shown in cinemas. I have seen it in cinema, um, but I did find it on YouTube this afternoon, and I can um, share the link with you probably afterwards or something because that was what I was clicking to as you saw when when we had that um, that little excerpt. But it takes the story from the the uh, the, the the British come out as as pretty. Uh, pretty villainous characters in it who uh, incite the the Zulus to attack the the boat trackers, and um, it takes you through that 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 story from from people moving, deciding they have to move through through to the, the trek through the uh, the massacre that takes place at I think it's Venin, uh, where the Zulus do um, massacre basically a, a wagon train. And then on to the Battle of Blood River, uh, and the the kind of um, uh, destiny um, uh, decreed by God for the the Africana people to to to, to rule there. So it's fifty four minutes, I think, uh, silent. Um, the version, unfortunately, the version as you heard, uh, has a heavy soundtrack which has been added. I think I'd prefer it without that but I've not been able to find a full version online without that soundtrack. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly worth, uh, worth seeing as a, the, you know, early, early filmmaking. I, I guess it was probably the first African film, I don't know, but um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's definitely a, a picture that's, uh, that was, shown in schools and so on it was very much part of the the, the nation building and there's been later films that um you know told the story of battle of blood river and things like that great thank you okay um next question what do you envision for the future of south africa in social and economic change oh <laughs> That's quite a, a challenging question. Um, as I said, you know, well, to, to, to cut back, I mean, and to put my own cards on the table, you know, I, I, I never thought I'd go to South Africa. I was a member of the anti-apartheid movement in UK as a student. Um, I campaigned in Royal Town Planning Institute for them to break their relationship with the apartheid-based South African Institute of Channel Regional Planners. So uh, I never expected, like most people, I think, that there would be a peaceful transition from apartheid. So that period of the early 90s, which of course coincides also with the, um, the collapse of the Soviet Union, was a period of great optimism and great expectations within South Africa. Um, and Mandela was a really crucial figure in that. And since then, governance has disappointed in, in many ways. There's been problems with corruption. The ANC has lost its, its, its sheen, although it still holds power. The South Africa remains the dominant economic force in Africa in, in, yeah, in Africa, Nigeria is probably second. But as I said, it's got, it, it's been so difficult shaking off this legacy of apartheid and built environments last a long time. And what we're building now will be there, you know, 30, 50 years from now. So hopefully um, there will be a peaceful progress towards greater equality. Uh, towards resolving the climate challenges which the country very definitely faces. And I hope that um, that can be done. And I've always found the South African people really fantastic and really um, engaging people who, who, who do have a sense of, of shared community. And, you know, you just hope that from that they can they can build forward, but the challenges are, are really huge, I think, and they they have had high growth, but they need really to 
to spread that growth around and to tackle the energy problems that the country's got. And as I say, the climate problems, whether that be the droughts that Cape Town's experienced or the, the floods in the more tropical areas down the East Coast. Great, thanks Cliff. Um, all right, well, it's a little past two o'clock if no one else has questions. Um, I guess we'll can wrap this up. All right, thanks again, Cliff, for your presentation on South Africa. Um, all right, attendees, mark your calendars for the next for next month's travelogue on November 15 at one o'clock central time. Our presenter will be Steve Harvey, who will present on South Sudan. Uh, Cliff, thanks again, and thank you for our attendees who uh, um, came to today's travelogue, and we'll see you again next time. Bye. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon.